thank you everyone for <coughs> having me up here to share this. Um, so, as Marcy said, we have been a couple since um, high school. <laughs> and we got married when we were 23 and had kids when we were 25, the same year that we started Juxtaposition Arts. <laughs> This is also when we had our first child, who describes um, juxtaposition as um, also uh, one of our children and the favorite child. <laughs> <laughs> so I am a heuristic learner. I learn by doing. And I had one of the best and probably the, um, arguably the most successful traditional educational experience um, in a class in sixth grade when we were making uh, greeting cards. And this, this came about because there was a goal that um, needed to be accomplished. And everybody has an amusement park in their, near, near their city. And in sixth grade, we had the opportunity to go to an amusement park if we were able to earn the money. Now, <laughs> the way that our instructor framed this is he was able to take a class of probably about 15 kids or so and each, you know, if you break a class down into about four parts the, with the different learning styles and have us make cards those who could write really well and do poetry took that part. Those who could do um, the gift of gab were able to sell. Those who could just fill in, filled in. And, <laughs> and that, is, that is where I, I learned um, sentence structure. That's where I learned long division. And that's where I learned how to move the decimal point from one place to another. And this can be applied into schools, you know, obviously all, all across the country. And if you just do a lecture type of approach in, in learning with kids, you'll, you'll, you'll get a specific response, which, which is kids will check out. You aren't meeting them where they're at. You're just teaching the way that you've been taught, and, and that's not necessarily effective. <clears throat> you can see me up there. Uh, this is the school where I met um, the other founder of Juxtaposition, um, Peyton. And he was in this guy's class. Uh, the year before. He was a saboteur as a teacher, and we would sneak out of school during, during school hours and go to Dinky Town and sell the cars. <laughs> <laughs> so that, that, that was the, the beginning of independent livelihood, setting, setting a goal, and uh, um, being able to use art that's more applied than it is hanging on the wall. So from, from making cards to making uh, textiles, graffiti jackets, to flyers, to backdrops, to um, pieces, to sculptures, that's, that's, that, that's how we evolved into bringing Juxta about. It was founded out of, out of our lived experience um, and, and, the, and the power of the arts to be able to transform and provide a tangible way to overcome adversity, um, to build community, and, and to create a pathway to education and entrepreneurship. Um, people often ask us what we do differently than other educational centers and programs, considering that we work with the at-risk kids. And we tell them, we give them a pencil and a brush, and they begin with their 10,000 hours of um, practice to become professionals. Alex and Jonah came to us in about sixth grade. And they were coming to us to ask questions about a report they were doing about aerosol, aerosol art. These kids had a lot, a lot of potential, um, but they didn't know too much about you know, art as, as far as um, street art went. So we were the quote-unquote experts, and they, and they would ask us questions. 
Um, and this report won this won the school blue ribbon. It won the regional blue ribbon. It went on to D.C. and they came in uh, about fourth. From there, they went to ninth grade and started um, doing what they learned at, at Juxta as far as um, designing t-shirts, designing logos. They started their own um, t-shirt line, which, is, which was turnstile, and that evolved into a few years with to Minnesota Nice. Um, in, in about 10th grade, they, they earned and saved so much money d doing this that uh, one day Alex called up his mom and said, I'm going to spend the night over at Jonah's, and then called her the next day from London, where she, <laughs> <laughs> him and an older friend bought a uh, ticket to tour Euro um, Europe and paint um, on the subways and paint on walls um, all throughout Europe. <laughs> So his mom didn't like it, obviously, but it was a testament to being empowered by something that you can do, something that's tangible, something that's relevant. And um, Jonah, on the other hand, designed t-shirts for us, taught um, airbrush classes, and we had the pleasure of um, working with Jonah in his third year at Harvard at the GSD when we in Indiana were there. So we did a shoe workshop um, in one of the portico rooms with kids from Dorchester, and that was a part of a curriculum in a school there that had to do with the carbon footprint, and it turned into a uh, billboard that was based on a curriculum from um, Ed Morris, one of the Loeb Fellows in, in uh, my year that came up with this. So, to now. So, a lot of this has to do with creative problem solving. And this is something that if you, if you, if you teach and you, and you nurturing kids early on, it helps them become stronger adults. Because as we know as adults, creative problem solving is like, is like the key. It's the key to helping these kids. It's the key to getting to work. It's the key to getting a home at the end of the day. Um, things aren't going to go as planned as much as, much as we think. Deficit-based approach um, are hesitant, safe, risk-averse, spends a lot of time planning, researching, testing, and often throwing out potential because projects and projections and, and experts say that they, that they won't work. We, we've pretty much been the underdog and, and um, been a part of the, uh, the kind of the new keyword when you, when you hear uh, capacity, they don't have enough capacity. That's saying that they don't have faith in what you do. Even though that you've been able to prove that over, we've been around for 16 years, um, and been able to, 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 to grow ever since. So if we were a stock, we'd see it just consistently go up as far as earned income, as far as um, physical growth, um, but then uh, you know, people in the neighborhood, politicians, funders, say they don't have capacity to really get the big bucks or the, um, the nurturing that um, other programs who do the song and dance would go ahead and get. So. So we're here today, and we continue to show and prove. So we also produce people that are creative problem solvers and 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 dispatch them into the world, where they're where they're able to where they're able to be saboteurs in their in their in their own circumference, taking a place, taking a challenge, and being able to leave it better than you found it. That's that's pretty much the goal of of what you want to do um, as a life and, 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 and as an organization and as a person. You want to leave a place or a thing or a person better than you found them. And, and that's what we've been trying to do um, here. Like the goal or the, the impetus for the, the project, the program, isn't to save anybody. We're not trying to save the, the poor at-risk youth. We're trying to create a place where youth can come and network on their own and can collaborate on their own, and can come up with these ideas, and and kids will naturally do that. They'll 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 if you create a place, you create an opportunity, they will come, and and that's and that's and that's how that that's how that happens. So this, if I had a before picture, this this used to be a house. This was a house when um, Sally and Jim came um, to do uh, an interview with me. This was this was a house, you know, right before we left, and it burned down when we were gone, and it was just a lot. And there's lots 
all over the U.S. Um, that are in need of, of uh, a, a little TLC. So this, was, this became a summer project where we, we um, collaborated with our next door neighbors, which um, are Urban Homeworks, and we did landscaping and some sculptures and um, made this a place where people can come and sit and have lunch now. Uh, they can um, have like a, like a drawing class or a meeting. You can do some Tai Chi in the morning. And that can be applied across the country. This is more or less showing what sustainable collaboration looks like. We've been working with um, CDES for about six or seven years now. And I like collaboration, but collaboration that, that makes sense and collaboration that is able to produce in collaboration that is more organic and um, not kind of contrived in collaboration. Kind of, I know funders and people want you to work with other people because that's that's kind of the kind of the kept thing or the or the or the word. But it needs to come naturally, and therefore it'll be sustainable and last a lot longer. This is a little bit of what our collaborations look like when when you when you when you put the names of the people who who we're working with. What we found is that youth creative genius in North Minneapolis is abundant and it's barely tapped. And this demographic is, you know, this, this is similar to, you know, to Gary, to Chicago, to Indianapolis, to um, all the cities that you can name that um, have, have, the, have, have the problems that um, people are trying to solve. But they're coming at it again from that deficit approach that um, we have uh, creative youth and um, an abundance of that. So the Twin Cities is one of the most vibrant um, creative communities in, in the nation as far as advertising, as far as Fortune 500. Um, and then in North Minneapolis you have this, you, you have a lot of the creative youth that, that you know, would bring about hip hop and the new, and the new you know, genres that are coming up. Um, but for some reason those things aren't meshing to kind of push the creative class, to kind of push um, creative problem solvers is, is like the focus that we're, that we're trying to do um, at Justin because we have a lot of the resources. So um, these are designs by formula and, and, and this is um, the direction that we're going as far as uh, our strategic direction for uh, 2011. Um, it's a um, program and facility expansion that um, employs uh, 100 youth as artists um, in the first year um, in, in, in five creative social enterprises. So these are things that we've been doing and now we're formally doing them. So somebody would come in and say, hey, we need a logo, hey, we need a, a poster design, a t-shirt. Now we're creating specific studios where kids will be employed and that will be their, um, that's what they will be getting paid for. We'll go through this, what we call visual arts literacy training, which will get their skills where they need to be as far as color theory and scale and proportion and how to you know, critique and interpret art, art history. One of our studios is screen printing because it, one is something that I, I know a lot about. I know about the industry, um, graphic design, um, again, natural progression with flyers in high school. So using what you have, and, and being able to leverage that is, is, is like key. Yeah, environmental design. Um, this is something that uh, Satoko brought to the mix. The space around you and how it affects you and how it affects people, traffic, and that, and that whole thing. So that's, that's one of the um, studios that we're going to have. Um, drawing and painting, large scale drawing and painting. This goes with murals. This is probably the biggest program. Um, and photography. This, is, this, this, this relates to um, building kids' portfolios so that they, they can do higher education um, and um, they can, they, they can uh, apply to different uh, arts high schools and so on. And, and this is what the building will look like um, when, it, when, it, when it gets done.